Chapter Seventeen of Palmetto Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Palmetto Leaves by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Seventeen Our Neighbor Over the Way. Mandarin. May fourteenth, eighteen seventy two. Our neighbor over the way is not, to be sure, quite so near or so observable as if one lived on Fifth Avenue or Broadway. Between us and his cottage lie five good miles of molten silver in the shape of the St. John's River, outspread this morning in all its quivering sheen, glancing, dimpling, and sparkling, dotted with sailboats and occasionally ploughed by steamboats gliding like white swans back and forth across the distance. Far over on the other side, where the wooded shores melt into pearly blue outlines, gleams out in the morning sun a white glimmering spot about as big as a ninepence, which shows us where his cottage stands. Thither we are going to make a morning visit. Our water coach is now approaching the little wharf front of our house, and we sally forth equipped with our sun umbrellas. For the middle of May here is like the middle of August at the north. The water coach, or rather omnibus, is a little thimble of a steamer, built for pleasuring on the St. John, called the Mary Draper. She is a tiny shell of a thing, but with a nice pretty cabin and capable of carrying comfortably thirty or forty passengers. During the height of the traveling season, the Mary Draper is let out to parties of tourists who choose thus at their leisure to explore the river, sailing, landing, rambling, exploring, hunting, fishing, and perhaps inevitably flirting among the flowery nooks and palmetto hammocks of the shore. We have seen her many a time coming gaily back from an excursion with the voice of singing, and laugh of youths and maidens resounding from her deck, flower-wreathed and flower-laden, like some fabled bark from the fairy isles. But now, in the middle of May, the tourists are few, and so the Mary Draper has been turned into a sort of errand-boat, plying up and down the river to serve the needs and convenience of the permanent inhabitants. A flag shown upon our wharf brings her in at our need, and we step gaily on board to be carried across to our neighbors. We take our seats at the shaded end of the boat and watch the retreating shore, with its gigantic live oaks rising like a dome above the orange orchards, its clouds of pink oleander trees that seem every week to blossom fuller than the last. And for a little moment, we can catch the snow-white glimmer of the great Cape jessamine shrub, which bends beneath the weight of flowers at the end of our veranda. Our little cottage looks like a rabbit's nest beside the monster oaks that shade it, but it is cozy to see them all out on the low veranda. The professor with his newspapers, the ladies with their worsteds and baskets, in fact, the whole of our large family, all reading, writing, working, in the shady covert of the orange trees. From time to time, a handkerchief is waved on their part, and the signal returned on ours, and they follow our receding motions with a spyglass. Our life is so still and lonely here that even so small an event as our crossing the river for a visit is all absorbing. But, after a while, our craft melts off into the distance. The Mary Draper looks to our friends no larger than a hazelnut, and the trees of the other side loom up strong and tall in our eyes and grow clearer and clearer, while our home, with its great live oaks and its orange groves, has all melted into a soft, woolly haze of distance. Our next neighbor's great whitewashed barn is the only sign of habitation remaining and that flashes out a mere shining speck in the distance. Now the boat comes up to Mr. Blank's wharf, and he is there to meet and welcome us. One essential to every country house 
on the St. John's is the accessory of a wharf and boathouse. The river is, for a greater or less distance from the shore, too shallow to admit the approach of steamboats, and wharfs of 50 or 100 feet in length are needed to enable passengers to land. The bottom of the river is of hard, sparkling white sand, into which spiles are easily driven, and the building and keeping up of such a wharf is a trifling trouble and expense in a land where lumber is so plentiful. Our friend, Mr. Blank, is, like many other old Floridian residents, originally from the north. In early youth he came to Florida, a condemned and doomed consumptive, recovered his health, and has lived a long and happy life here, and acquired a handsome property. He owns extensive tracts of rich and beautiful land on the west bank of the St. John's, between it and Jacksonville, destined, as that city grows and extends, to become of increasing value. His wife, like himself originally of northern origin, has become perfectly acclimated and naturalized by years' residence at the South, and is to all intents and purposes a southern woman. They live all the year upon their place. Those who formerly were their slaves settled peaceably around them as free laborers, still looking up to them for advice, depending on them for aid, and rendering to them the willing, well-paid services of freemen. The house is a simple white cottage, situated so as to command a noble view of the river. A long avenue of young live oak trees leads up from the river to the house. The ground is covered with a smooth, even turf of Bermuda grass, the only kind that will endure the burning glare of the tropical summer. The walls of the house are covered with roses, now in full bloom. La Marquet, cloth of gold, and many other kind throw out their splendid clusters and fill the air with fragrance. We find Mrs. Blank and her family on the veranda, the usual reception room in a southern house. The house is the seat of hospitality, every room in it sure to be full, if not with the members of the family proper, than with guests from Jacksonville who find in this high, breezy situation a charming retreat from the heat of the city. One feature is characteristic of southern houses, so far as we have seen. The ladies are enthusiastic plant lovers, and the veranda is lined round with an array of boxes in which gardening experiments are carried on. Rare plants, slips, choice seedlings are here nurtured and cared for. In fact, the burning power of the tropical sun and the scalding fine white sand is such that to put a tender plant or slip into it seems, in the words of scripture, like casting it into the oven. And so there is everywhere more or less of this box gardening. The cottage was all in summer array. The carpets taken up and packed away, leaving the smooth yellow pine floors clean and cool as the French parquets. The plan of the cottage is the very common one of southern houses. A wide, clear hall, furnished as a sitting room, opening on a veranda on either end, goes through the house, and all the other rooms open upon it. We sat chatting, first on the veranda, and as the sun grew hotter, retreated inward to the hall and discussed flowers, farm, and dairy. On the east bank of the St. John's, where our own residence is, immediately around Mandarin, the pasturage is poor, and the cattle diminutive and half-starved. Knowing that our neighbor was an old resident, an enthusiastic stock raiser and breeder, we came to him for knowledge on these subjects. Stock breeding has received a great share of attention from the larger planters of Florida. The small breed of wild native Florida cattle has been crossed and improved by foreign stock imported at great expense. The Brahmin cattle of India, as coming from a tropical region, were thought specially adapted to the Floridian climate and have thriven well here. By crossing these with the Durham and the Ayrshire and the native cattle, fine varieties of animals have been obtained. 
Mr. Blank showed me a list of fifty of his finest cows, each one of which has its distinguishing name, and with whose pedigree and peculiarities he seemed well acquainted. In rearing, the Floridian system has always been to make everything subservient to the increase of the herd. The calf is allowed to run with the cow, and the supply of milk for the human being is only what is over and above the wants of the calf. The usual mode of milking is to leave the calf sucking on one side, while the milker sits on the other and gets his portion. It is an opinion fixed as fate in the mind of every negro cow tender that to kill a calf would be the death of the mother, and that if you separate the calf from the mother, her milk will dry up. Fresh veal is a delicacy unheard of, and once, when we suggested a veal pie to a strapping Ethiopian dairy woman, she appeared as much shocked as if we had proposed to fricassee a baby. Mr. Blank, however, expressed his conviction that the northern method of taking off the calf and securing the cow's milk could be practiced with success, and had been in one or two cases. The yield of milk of some of the best blood cows was quite equal to that of northern milkers, and might be kept up by good feeding. As a rule, however, stock raisers depend for their supply of milk more on the number of their herd than the quantity given by each. The expenses of raising are not heavy, where there is a wide expanse of good pasture land for them to range in, and no necessity for shelters of any kind through the year. Mr. Blank spoke of the river grass as being a real and valuable species of pasturage. On the west side of the river, the flats and shallows along by the shore are covered with a broad-leaved water grass, very tender and nutritious, of which cattle are very fond. It is a curious sight to see whole herds of cows browsing in the water, as one may do every day along the course of this river. The subject of dairy keeping came up, and at our request, Mrs. Blank led the way to hers. It is built out under a dense shade of trees in an airy situation, with double walls like an ice house. The sight of the snowy shelves set round with pans on which a rich golden cream was forming was a sufficient testimony that there could be beautiful, well-kept dairies in Florida notwithstanding its tropical heats. The butter is made every morning at an early hour, and we had an opportunity of tasting it at the dinner table. Like the best butter of England and France, it is sweet and pure, like solidified cream, and as different as can be from the hard, salty mass, which most generally passes for butter among us. The buttermilk of a daily churning is also sweet and rich, a delicious nourishing drink, and an excellent adjuvant in the making of various cakes and other household delicacies. Our friend's experience satisfied us that there was no earthly reason in the climate or surroundings of Florida why milk and butter should be the scarce and expensive luxuries they are now. What one private gentleman can do simply for his own comfort and that of his family we should think might be repeated on a larger scale by somebody in the neighborhood of Jacksonville as a money speculation. Along the western bank of this river are hundreds of tracts of good grazing land where cattle might be pastured at small expense, where the products of a dairy on a large scale would meet a ready and certain sale. At present, the hotels and boarding houses are supplied with condensed milk and butter imported from the north. And yet land is cheap here, labor is reasonable, the climate genial, requiring no outlay for shelter, and comparatively little necessity of storing food for winter. Fine breeds of animals of improved stock exist already, and can be indefinitely increased. And we wonder that nobody is to be found to improve the opportunity to run a stock and dairy farm which shall supply the hotels and boarding houses of Jacksonville. After visiting the dairy, we sauntered about, looking at the poultry yards, where different breeds of hens, turkeys, peafowl, had each their allotted station. Four or five big dogs, hounds and pointers, 
trotted round with us, or rollicked with a party of grandchildren, assisted by the never-failing addition of a band of giggling little Negroes. As in the old times, the servants of the family have their little houses back of the premises, and the laundry work and such is carried on outside. The propensity at the South is to multiply little buildings. At the North, where there is a winter to be calculated on, the tactics of living are different. The effort is to gather all the needs and wants of life under one roof, to be warmed and kept in order at small expense. In the South, where building material is cheap and building is a slight matter, there is a separate little building for everything, and the back part of an estate looks like an eruption of little houses. There is a milk house, a corn house, a tool house, a bake house, besides a house for each of the leading servants, making quite a village. Our dinner was a bountiful display of the luxuries of a southern farm. Finely flavored fowl, choicely cooked, fish from the river, soft-shell turtle soup, with such a tempting variety of early vegetables as seemed to make it impossible to do justice to all. Mrs. Blank offered us a fine sparkling wine made of the juice of the wild orange. In color, it resembled the finest sherry and was much like it in flavor. We could not help thinking as we refused dainty after dainty from mere inability to take more, or the thoughtless way in which it is often said that there can be nothing fit to eat got in Florida. Mr. Blank's family is supplied with food almost entirely from the products of his own farm. He has the nicest of fed beef, nice tender pork, poultry of all sorts, besides the resources of an ample, well-kept dairy. He raises and makes his own syrup. He has sweet potatoes, corn, and all northern vegetables in perfection. Peaches, grapes of finest quality, besides the strictly tropical fruits, and all that he has, any other farmer might also have with the same care. After dinner, we walked out to look at the grapes, which hung in profuse clusters, just beginning to ripen on the vines. On our way, we stopped to admire a great, bitter-sweet orange tree, which seemed to make Hesperian fables true. It was about thirty feet in height, and with branches that drooped to the ground, weighed down at the same time with great golden balls of fruit, and wreaths of pearly buds and blossoms. Every stage of fruit, from the tiny green ball of a month's growth to the perfected orange, were here, all the processes of life going on together in joyous unity. The tree exemplified what an orange tree could become when fully fed, when its almost boundless capacity for digesting nutriment meets a full supply, and it certainly stood one of the most royal of trees. Its leaves were large, broad, and of that glossy varnished green peculiar to the orange, and its young shoots looked like burnished gold. The bittersweet orange is much prized by some. The pulp is sweet, with a certain spicy flavor, but the rind and all the inner membranes that contain the fruit are bitter as quinine itself. It is held to be healthy to eat of both, as the acid and the bitter are held to be alike correctives of the bilious tendencies of the climate. But the afternoon sun was casting the shadows the other way, and the little buzzing Mary Draper was seen puffing in the distance on her way back from Jacksonville, and we walked leisurely down the live oak avenues to the wharf, our hands full of roses and oriental jessamine, and many pleasant memories of our neighbors over the way. And now, in relation to the general subject of farming in Florida. Our own region east of the St. John's River is properly a little sandy belt of land about 18 miles wide, washed by the Atlantic Ocean on one side and the St. John's River on the other. It is not by any means so well adapted to stock farming or general farming as the western side of the river. Its principal value is in fruit farming, 
and it will appear by a voyage up the river that all the finest old orange groves and all the new orange plantations are on the eastern side of the river. The presence on either side of two great bodies of water produces a more moist and equable climate and less liable to frosts. In the great freeze of 1835, the orange groves of the West Bank were killed beyond recovery while the fine groves of mandarins sprang up again from the root, and have been vigorous bearers for years since. But opposite the mandarin, along the western shore, lie miles and miles of splendid land, which in the olden time produced cotton of the finest quality, sugar, rice, sweet potatoes, now growing back into forest with a tropical rapidity. The land lies high, and affords fine sites for dwellings, and the region is comparatively healthy. Then Hibernia, Magnolia, and Green Cove on the one side, and Jacksonville on the other, show perfect assemblages of boarding houses and hotels, where ready market might be found for what good farmers might raise. A colony of farmers coming out and settling out here together bringing with them church and schoolhouse, with a minister skilled like St. Bernard, both in husbandry and divinity, might soon create a thrifty farming village. We will close this chapter with an extract from a letter of a northern emigrant recently settled at Newport, on the north part of Appalachicola Bay, September 22, 1872. I have been haying this month. In fact, I had mowed my orange grove, a square of two acres, from time to time all summer. But this month, a field of two acres had a heavy burden of grass with cow peas intermixed. In some parts of the field, there certainly would be at the rate of three tons to the acre. The whole field would average one ton to the acre. So I went at it with a good northern scythe and mowed every morning an hour or two. The hay was perfectly cured by 5 p.m., same day, and put in barn. The land, being in ridges, made mowing difficult. Next year, I mean to lay that land down to grass, taking out clumps and making smooth, sowing rye and clover. I shall plow it now as soon as the hay is all made, and sow the rye and clover immediately. I have five cows that give milk, and four that should come in soon. These, with their calves, I shall feed through the months when the grass is poor. I have also a yoke of oxen and four young steers, with trim the mule. I have already in the barn three to four tons of hay and corn fodder, and two acres of cow peas cured to be used as hay. I hope to have five hundred bushels of sweet potatoes which for stock are equal to corn. I made a hundred and ten bushels of corn, twenty-five to the acre. My cane is doing moderately well. Hope to have all the seed I want to plant fourteen acres next year. Bananas thrive beautifully. Shall have fifty offsets to set out this winter. Also three or four thousand oranges. All large size and fair. All these facts go to show that while Florida cannot compete with the northern and western states as a grass-raising state, yet there are other advantages in her climate and productions which make stock farming feasible and profitable. The disadvantages of her burning climate may, to a degree, be evaded and overcome by the application of the same patient industry and ingenuity which rendered fruitful the iron soil and freezing climate of the New England states. End of chapter 17. Recording by Sheila Blunt. Chapter 18 of Palmetto Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Palmetto Leaves by Harriet Beecher Stowe 
Chapter 18 The Grand Tour Upriver The St. John's is the grand water highway through some of the most beautiful portions of Florida, and tourists safely seated at ease on the decks of steamers can penetrate into the mysteries and wonders of unbroken tropical forests. During the season, boats continually run from Jacksonville to Enterprise and back again, the round trip being made for a moderate sum and giving, in a very easy and comparatively inexpensive manner, as much of the peculiar scenery as mere tourists care to see. On returning, a digression is often made at Tekoi, where passengers cross a horse railroad of 15 miles to St. Augustine, thus rendering their survey of East Florida more complete. In fact, what may be seen and known of the state in such a trip is about all that the majority of tourists see and know. The great majority also perform this trip and see this region in the dead of winter, when certainly one half of the glorious forests upon the shore are bare of leaves. It is true that the great number of evergreen trees here make the shores at all times quite different from those of a northern climate. Yet the difference between spring and winter is as great here as there. Our party were resolute in declining all invitations to join parties in January, February, and March, being determined to wait till the new spring foliage was in its glory. When the magnolia flowers were beginning to blossom, we were ready and took passage, a joyous party of eight or ten individuals, on the steamer Darlington commanded by Captain Broach, and is often asserted by Commodore Rose. The latter, in this day of women's rights, is no mean example of female energy and vigor. She is stewardess of the boat, and magnifies her office. She's a colored woman, once a slave owned by Captain Broach, but emancipated, as the story goes, for her courage and presence of mind in saving his life in a steamboat disaster. Rose is short and thick, weighing some two or three hundred, with a brown complexion and a pleasing face and fine eyes. Her voice, like that of most colored women, is soft, and her manner of speaking pleasing. All this, however, relates to her demeanor when making the agreeable to passengers. In other circumstances, doubtless, she can speak louder, and with considerable more emphasis, and show, in short, those martial attributes which have won for her the appellation of the Commodore. It is asserted that the whole charge of provisioning and running the boat and all its internal arrangements vests in Madame Rose, and that nobody can get ahead of her in a bargain, or resist her will in an arrangement. She knows every inch of the river, every house, every plantation along shore, its former or present occupants and history, and is always ready with an answer to a question. The arrangement and keeping of the boat do honor to her. Nowhere in Florida does the guest sit at a more bountifully furnished table. Our desserts and pastry were really, for the wilderness, something quite astonishing. The St. John's River below Palatka has few distinguishing features to mark it out from other great rivers. It is so wide that the foliage of the shores cannot be definitely made out, and the tourist here expecting his palm trees and his magnolias and flowering vines is disappointed by sailing in what seems a never-ending great lake where the shores are off in the distance too far to make out anything in particular. But after leaving Palatka, the river grows narrower, the overhanging banks approach nearer, and the foliage becomes more decidedly tropical in its character. Our boat, after touching as usual at Hibernia, Magnolia, and Green Cove, brought up at Palatka late in the afternoon, 
made but a short stop and was on her way again it was the first part of may and the forests were in that fullness of leafy perfection which they attain in the month of june at the north but there is a peculiar vivid brilliancy about the green of the new spring leaves here which we never saw elsewhere it is a brilliancy like some of the new french greens now so much in vogue and reminding one of the metallic brightness of birds and insects in the woods the cypress is a singular and beautiful feature it attains to a great age and immense size the trunk and branches of an old cypress are smooth and white as ivory while its light feathery foliage is of the most dazzling golden green and rising as it often does amid clumps of dark varnished evergreens bay and magnolia and myrtle it has a singular and beautiful effect the long swaying draperies of the gray moss interpose everywhere their wavering outlines and pearl tints amid the brightness and bloom of the forest giving to its deep recesses the mystery of grottoes hung with fanciful vegetable stalactites the palmetto tree appears in all stages from its earliest growth when it looks like a fountain of great green fan leaves bursting from the earth to its perfect shape when sixty or seventy feet in height it rears its fan crown high in air the oldest trees may be known by a perfectly smooth trunk all traces of the scaly formation by which it has built itself up in ring after ring of leaves being obliterated but younger trees thirty or forty feet in height often show a trunk which seems to present a regular criss-cross of basket-work the remaining scales from whence the old leaves have decayed and dropped away these scaly trunks are often full of ferns wild flowers and vines which hang in fantastic draperies down their sides and form leafy and flowery pillars the palmetto hammocks as they are called are often miles in extent along the banks of the rivers the tops of the palms rise up round in the distance as so many haycocks and seeming to rise one above another far as the eye can reach we have never been so fortunate as to be able to explore one of these palmetto groves the boat sails with a provoking quickness by many a scene that one longs to dwell upon study and investigate we've been told however by hunters that they afford admirable camping ground being generally high and dry with a flooring of clean white sand their broad leaves are a perfect protection from rain and dew and the effect of the glare of the campfires and torchlights on the tall pillars and waving fan-like canopy overhead is said to be perfectly magical the most unromantic and least impressible speak of it with enthusiasm in going up the river darkness overtook us shortly after leaving palatka we sat in a golden twilight and saw the shores every moment becoming more beautiful but when the twilight faded and there was no moon we sought the repose of our cabin it was sultry as august although only the first part of may and our younger and sprightlier members who were on the less breezy side of the boat after fruitlessly trying to sleep arose and dressed themselves and sat all night on deck by this means they saw a sight worth seeing and one which we should have watched all night to see the boat's course at night is through narrows of the river and where we could hear the crashing and crackling of bushes and trees and sometimes a violent thud as the boat in turning a winding struck against the bank on the forward part two great braziers were kept filled with blazing resinous light wood to guide the pilot in the path of the boat the effect of this glare of red light as the steamer passed through the palmetto hammocks 
and moss-hung grottoes of the forest was something that must have been indescribably weird and beautiful and our young friends made us suitably regret that our more airy sleeping accommodations had lost us this experience in the morning we woke at enterprise having come through all the most beautiful and characteristic part of the way by night enterprise is some hundred and thirty miles south of our dwelling place in mandarin and of course that much nearer the tropical regions we had planned excursions explorations picnics in the woods and a visit to the beautiful spring in the neighborhood but learned with chagrin that the boat made so short a stay that none of these things were possible the only thing that appears to the naked eye of a steamboat traveler in enterprise is a large hotel down upon the landing said by those who have tested it to be one of the best kept hotels in florida the aspect of the shore just there is no way picturesque or inviting but has more that forlorn ragged desolate air that new settlements on the river are apt to have the wild untouched banks are beautiful but the new settlements generally succeed in destroying all nature's beauty and give you only leafless girdled trees blackened stumps and naked white sand in return turning our boat homeward we sailed in clear morning light back through the charming scenery which we had slept through the night before it is the most wild dreamlike enchanting sail conceivable the river sometimes narrows so that the boat brushes under overhanging branches and then widens into beautiful lakes dotted with wooded islands palmetto hammocks live oak groves cypress pine bay and magnolia form an interchanging picture vines hang festooned from tree to tree wild flowers tempt the eye on the near banks and one is constantly longing for the boat to delay here or there but on goes her steady course the pictured scene around constantly changing every now and then the woods break away for a little space and one sees orange and banana orchards and houses evidently newly built at many points the boat landed and put off kegs of nails hoes plows provisions groceries some old plantations were passed whose name and history seemed familiar to madame rose but by far the greater number were new settlements with orchards of quite young trees which will require three or four more years to bring into bearing the greater number of fruit trees and settlements were on the eastern shore of the river which for the reasons we have spoken of is better adapted for the culture of fruit one annoyance on board the boat was the constant and pertinacious firing kept up by that class of men who think that the chief end of man is to shoot something now we can put up with good earnest hunting or fishing done for the purpose of procuring man food or even the fur and feathers that hit his fancy and taste but we detest indiscriminate and purposeless maiming and killing of happy animals who have but one life to live and for whom the agony of broken bones or torn flesh is a helpless hopeless pain unrelieved by any of the resources which enable us to endure a parcel of hulking fellows sit on the deck of a boat and pass through the sweetest paradise god ever made without one idea of its loveliness one gentle sympathizing thought of the animal happiness with which the creator has filled these recesses all the way along is a constant fusillade upon every living thing that shows itself on the bank now a bird is hit and hangs head downward with a broken wing and a coarse laugh choruses the deed now an alligator is struck and the applause is greater 
we once saw a harmless young alligator whose dying struggles as he threw out his poor little black paws piteously like human hands seemed to be vastly diverting to these cultivated individuals they wanted nothing of him except to see how he would act when he was hit dying agonies are so very amusing now and then these sons of nimrod in their zeal put in peril the nerves if not lives of passengers one such actually fired at an alligator right across a crowd of ladies many of them invalids and persisted in so firing a second time after having been requested to desist if the object were merely to show the skill of the marksman why not practice upon inanimate objects an old log looks like an alligator why not practice on an old log it requires as much skill to hit a branch as the bird singing on it why not practice on the branch but no it must be something that enjoys and can suffer something that loves life and must lose it certainly this is an inherent savagery difficult to account for killing for killing's sake belongs not even to the tiger the tiger kills for food man for amusement at evening we were again at palatka when the great question was discussed would we or would we not take the tour up the okolawaha to see the enchanted wonders of the silver spring the okolawaha boat lay at the landing and we went to look at it the okolawaha is a deep narrow stream by the by emptying into the st john's with a course as crooked as apollo's ram's horn and a boat has been constructed for the express purpose of this passage the aspect of this same boat on a hot night was not inspiriting it was low long and narrow its sides were rubbed glassy smooth or torn and creased by the friction of the bushes and trees it had pushed through it was without glass windows which would be of no use in such navigation and in place thereof furnished with strong shutters to close the air holes we looked at this same thing as it lay like a gigantic coffin in the twilight and thought even the silver spring would not pay for being immured there and turned away a more inviting project was to step into a sailboat and be taken in the golden twilight over to colonel hart's orange grove which is said with reason we believe to be the finest in florida we landed in the twilight in this grove of six hundred beautiful orange trees in as high condition as the best culture could make them the well-fed orange tree is known by the glossy deep green of its foliage as a declining tree is by the yellow tinge of its leaves these trees looked as if each leaf if broken would spurt with juice piles of fish guano and shell banks prepared as top dress for the orchard were lying everywhere about mingling not agreeably with the odor of orange blossoms we thought to ourselves that if the orange orchard must be fed upon putrefying fish we should prefer not to have a house in it the employee who has charge of the orchard lives in a densely shaded cottage in the edge of it a large fruit house has recently been built there and the experiments of colonel hart seem to demonstrate that even if there occur severe frosts in the early winter there is no sort of need therefore of losing the orange crop his agent showed us oranges round and fair that had been kept three months in moss in this fruit house and looking as fresh and glossy as those upon the trees this if proved by experience all was possible does away with the only uncertainty relating to the orange crop undoubtedly the fruit is far better to continue all winter on the trees and be gathered from time to time as wanted as has always been the practice in florida but with fruit houses and moss it will be possible in case of a threatened fall of temperature to secure the crop 
the oranges that come to us from malaga and sicily are green as grass when gathered and packed and ripen as much as they do ripen on the voyage over we should suppose the oranges of florida might be gathered much nearer ripe in the fall ripen in the house or on the way and still be far better than any from the foreign market on this point fruit growers are now instituting experiments which we trust will make this delicious crop certain as it is abundant sailing back across the water we landed and were conveyed to the winter country seat of a brooklyn gentleman who is with great enthusiasm cultivating a place there it was almost dark and we could only hear of his gardens and grounds and improvements not see them in the morning before the boat left the landing he took us a hasty drive around the streets of the little village it is an unusually pretty attractive looking place for a florida settlement one reason for this is that the streets and vacant lots are covered with a fine green turf which at a distance looks like our new england grass it is a mixture of bermuda grass with a variety of herbage and has just as good general effect as if it were the best red top there are several fine residences in and around palatka mostly winter seats of northern settlers the town has eight stores which do a business for all the surrounding country for miles it has two large hotels several boarding houses two churches two steam sawmills and is the headquarters for the steamboats of the upper st john's and its tributaries four or five steamers from different quarters are often stopping at its wharf at a time the dictator and city point from charleston run to this place outside by the ocean passage and entering the mouth of the st john's stop at jacksonville by the way the nick king and lizzie baker in like manner make what is called the inside trip skimming through the network of islands that line the coast and bringing up at the same points then there are the river lines continually plying between jacksonville and this place and the small boats that run weekly to the oklawaha all these make palatka a busy lively and important place with palatka the interest of our return voyage finished with green cove springs magnolia hibernia at all of which we touched on our way back we were already familiar and the best sight of all was the cottage under the oaks to which we gladly returned end of chapter eighteen recording by john brandon chapter nineteen of palmetto leaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon palmetto leaves by harriet beecher stowe chapter nineteen old cujo and the angel the little wharf at mandarin is a tiny abutment into the great blue sea of the st john's waters five miles in width the opposite shores gleam out blue in the vanishing distance and the small wharf is built so far out that one feels there as in a boat at sea here trundled down on the truck along a descending tramway come the goods which at this point await shipment on some of the many steamboats which ply back and forth upon the river and here are landed by almost every steamer goods and chattels for the many families which are hidden in the shadows of the forests that clothe the river's shore in sight are scarce a dozen houses all told but far back for a radius of ten or fifteen miles are scattered farmhouses whence come tributes of produce to this point hundreds of barrels of oranges boxes of tomatoes and early vegetables grapes peaches and pomegranates here pause on their way to the jacksonville market one morning as the professor and i were enjoying our morning stroll on the little wharf an unusual sight met our eye a bale of cotton long and large pressed hard and solid as iron 
and done up and sewed in a holy workmanlike manner that excited our surprise it was the first time since we had been in mandarin a space of some four or five years that we had ever seen a bale of cotton on that wharf yet the whole soil of east florida is especially adapted not only to the raising of cotton but of the peculiar long staple cotton which commands the very highest market price but for two or three years past the annual ravages of the cotton worm had been so discouraging that the culture of cotton had been abandoned in despair whence then had come that most artistic bale of cotton so well pressed so trim and tidy and got up altogether in so superior a style standing by it on the wharf was an aged negro misshapen and almost deformed he was thin and bony and his head and beard were grizzled with age he was black as night itself and but for a glittering intellectual eye he might have been taken for a big baboon the missing link of darwin to him spoke the professor giving a punch with his cane upon the well-packed solid bale why this is splendid cotton where did it come from who raised it we raise it sir me and dis here boy pointing to a middle-aged black man beside him we raise it where oh out here a piece a lounging white man never wanting on a wharf here interposed oh this is old cujo he lives up in julington he's an honest old fellow now we had heard of this settlement up julington some two or three years before a party of negroes from south carolina and georgia had been induced to come into florida and take up a tract of government land some white man in whom they all put confidence had undertaken for them the task of getting their respective allotments surveyed and entered for them so that they should have a solid basis of land to work upon here then they settled down and finding accidentally that a small central lot was not enclosed in any of the allotments they took it as an indication that there was to be their church and accordingly erected there a prayer booth where they could hold those weekly prayer meetings which often seem with the negroes to take the place of all other recreations the neighboring farmers were not particularly well disposed towards the little colony the native floridian farmer is a quiet peaceable being not at all disposed to infringe the rights of others and mainly anxious for peace and quietness but they supposed that a stampede of negroes from georgia and carolina meant trouble for them meant depredations upon their cattle and poultry and regarded it with no friendly eye yet nevertheless they made no demonstration against it under these circumstances the new colony had gone to work with untiring industry they had built log cabins and barns they had split rails and fenced in their land they had planted orange trees they had cleared acres of the scrub palmetto and any one that has ever seen what it is to clear up an acre of scrub palmetto will best appreciate the meaning of that toil only those black men with sinews of steel and nerves of wire men who grow stronger and more vigorous under those burning suns that would wither the white men are competent to the task but old cujo had at last brought his land from the wild embrace of the snaky scrub palmetto to the point of bearing a bale of cotton like the one on the wharf he had subdued the savage earth brought her under and made her tributary to his will and demonstrated what the soil of east florida might could and would do the cotton worm to the contrary notwithstanding and yet this morning he stood by his cotton drooping and dispossessed the white man that had engaged to take up land for these colonists had done his work in such a slovenly imperfect manner that another settler a foreigner 
had taken up a tract which passed right through old cujo's farm and taken the land on which he had spent four years of hard work taken his log cabin and barn and young trees and the very piece that he had just brought to bearing that bale of cotton and there he stood by it mournful and patient it was only a continuation of what he had always experienced always oppressed always robbed and cheated old cujo was making the best of it in trying to ship his bale of cotton which was all that was left of four years toil what said the professor to him are you the old man that's been turned out by that foreigner yes sir he said his little black eyes kindling and quivering from head to foot with excitement he take eberting eberting my house i built myself my fences and more'n three thousand rails i split myself he take em all there is always some bitter spot in a great loss that is sorer than the rest those rails evidently cut cujo to the heart the three thousand rails kept coming in in his narrative as the utter and unbearable aggravation of injustice i split em myself sir every one three thousand rails and he take em all and won't he allow you anything no sir he won't allow me nothin he say get along with you don't know nothin bout you dis your land mine i tell him you don't know old cujo but de lord know him and by and by when de angel gabriel come and put one foot on de sea and tudder on de land and blow de trumpet he blow once for old cujo you mind now this was not merely spoken but acted the old black kindled and stepped off in pantomime he put as it were one foot on the sea and the other on the land he raised his cane trumpet wise to his mouth it was all as vivid as reality to him none of the images of the bible are more frequent favorite and operative among the black race than this you hear it over and over in every prayer meeting it's sung in wild chorus in many a spiritual the great angel gabriel the trumpet the mighty pomp of the last judgment has been the appeal of thousands of wronged crushed despairing hearts through the ages of oppression faith in god's justice faith in a final triumph of right over wrong a practical faith such had been the attainment of this poor old deformed black that and his bale of cotton were all he had to show for a life's labor he had learned two things in his world lesson work and faith he had learned the power of practical industry in things possible to man he had learned the sublimer power of faith in god for things impossible well of course we were indignant enough about poor old cujo but we feared that the distant appeal of the angel and the last trump was all that remained to him and to our lesser faith that seemed a long way to look for justice but redress was nearer than we imagined old cujo's patient industry and honest work had wrought favor among his white neighbors he had lived down the prejudice with which the settlement had first been regarded for among quiet honest people like the floridians it is quite possible to live down prejudice a neighboring justice of the peace happened to have an acquaintance in washington from this very district acquainted with all the land and land titles he wrote to this man an account of the case and he interested himself for old cujo he went to the land office to investigate the matter he found that in both cases certain formalities necessary to constitute a legal entrance had been omitted and he fulfilled for old cujo these formalities thus settling his title and moreover he sent legal papers by which the sheriff of the county was enabled to do him justice and so old cujo was reinstated in his rights the professor met him sparkling and jubilant on the wharf once more well cujo de angel blew for you quicker than you expected he laughed all over ye ha ha yes massa 
then with his usual histrionic vigor he acted over the scene de sheriff he come down here he tell dat man you go right off here don't you touch none dem rails don't you take one chip not one chip don't you take ha <laughs> ha then he added he come to me sir he say cool joe what you take for your land he say he give me two hundred dollars i tell him dat too cheap dat all too cheap he say cujo what will you take i say i take ten thousand million dollars dat's what i take ha 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 end of chapter nineteen recording by john brandon Chapter Twenty of Palmetto Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Palmetto Leaves by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Twenty The Laborers of the South who shall do the work for us is the inquiry in this new state where there are marshes to be drained forests to be cut down palmetto plains to be grubbed up and all under the torrid heats of a tropical sun chinese say some swedes say others germans others but let us look at the facts before our face and eyes the thermometer for these three days past has risen over ninety every day no white man that we know of dares stay in the fields later than ten o'clock then he retires under shade to take some other and less exposing work the fine white sand is blistering hot one might fancy that an egg would cook as on mount vesuvius by simply burying it in the sand yet the black laborers whom we leave in the field pursue their toil if anything more actively more cheerfully than during the cooler months the sun awakes all their vigor and all their boundless jollity when their nooning time comes they sit down not in the shade but in some good hot place in the sand and eat their lunch and then stretch out hot and comfortable to take their noon siesta with the full glare of the sun upon them down in the swamp land near our house we have watched old simon as from hour to hour he drove his wheelbarrow heavy with blocks of muck up a steep bank and deposited it why simon we say how can you work so in this hot weather the question provokes an explosion of laughter ya ha ho 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 missy it be hot dat so ho 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 how can you work so i can't even think how you can do such hard work under such a sun dat so ho ho ladies can't no day can't bless you ma'am and simon trundles off with his barrow chuckling in his might comes up with another load throws it down and chuckles again a little laugh goes a great way with simon for a boiling spring of animal content is ever welling up within one tremendously hot day we remember our steamer stopping at fernandina owing to the state of the tide the wharf was eight or ten feet above the boat and the plank made a steep inclined plane down which a mountain of multifarious freight was to be shipped on our boat a gang of negroes great brawny muscular fellows seemed to make a perfect frolic of this job which under such a sun would have threatened sunstroke to any white man how they ran and shouted and jabbered and sweated their shirts through as one after another received on their shoulders great bags of cotton seed or boxes and bales and ran down the steep plain with them into the boat at last a low squat giant of a fellow with the limbs and muscles of a great dray horse placed himself in front of a large truck and made his fellows pile it high with cotton bags then holding back with a prodigious force he took the load steadily down the steep plain till within a little of the bottom when he dashed suddenly forward and landed it half across the boat this feat of gigantic strength he repeated again and again running up each time apparently as fresh as if nothing had happened shouting laughing drinking quarts of water and sweating like a river god never was harder work done in more jolly spirit 
now when one sees such sights as these one may be pardoned for thinking that the negro is a natural laborer of tropical regions he is immensely strong he thrives and flourishes physically under a temperature that exposes a white man to disease and death the malarial fevers that bear so hard on the white race have far less effect on the negro it is rare that they have what are called here the shakes and they increase and multiply and bear healthy children in situations where the white race deteriorate and grow sickly on this point we had an interesting conversation with a captain employed in the government coast survey the duties of this survey involve much hard labor exposure to the fiercest extremes of tropical temperature and sojourning and traveling in swamps and lagoons often most deadly to the white race for this reason he manned his vessel with a crew composed entirely of negroes and he informed us that the result had been perfectly satisfactory the negro constitution enabled them to undergo with less suffering and danger the severe exposure and toils of the enterprise and the gaiety and good nature which belonged to the race made their toils seem to sit lighter upon them than upon a given number of white men he had known them after a day of heavy exposure travelling through mud and swamps and cutting saw-grass which wounds like a knife to sit down at evening and sing songs and play on the banjo laugh and tell stories in the very best of spirits he furthermore valued them for their docility and perfect subjection to discipline he announced strict rules forbidding all drunkenness and profanity and he never found a difficulty in enforcing these rules their obedience and submission were perfect when this gentleman was laid up with an attack of fever in st augustine his room was beset by anxious negro mammies relations of his men bringing fruits flowers and delicacies of their compounding for the captain those who understand and know how to treat the negroes seldom have reason to complain of their ingratitude but it is said by northern men who come down with northern habits of labor that the negro is inefficient as a laborer it is to be conceded that the influence of climate and constitution and the past benumbing influences of slavery do make the habits of southern laborers very different from the habits of northern men accustomed by the shortness of summer and the length of winter to set the utmost value on their working time in the south where growth goes on all year round there really is no need of that intense driving energy and vigilance in the use of time that are needed in the short summers of the north an equal amount can be done with less labor but the northern man when he first arrives before he has proved the climate looks with impatient scorn on what seems to him the slow shilly-shally style in which both black and white move on it takes an attack of malarial fever or two to teach him that he cannot labor the day through under a tropical sun as he can in the mountains of new hampshire after a shake or two of this kind he comes to be thankful if he can hire a cujo or a pompey to plough and hoe his fields through the blazing hours even though they do not plough and hoe with all the alacrity of northern farmers it is also well understood that in taking negro laborers we have to take men and women who have been educated under a system the very worst possible for making good efficient careful or honest laborers take any set of white men and put them for two or three generations under the same system of work without wages forbid them legal marriage and secure family ties and we will venture to predict that they would come out of the ordeal a much worse set than the southern laborers are we have had in our own personal experience pretty large opportunities of observation immediately after the war two young new england men hired the mackintosh plantation opposite to mandarin on the west bank of the st john's river it was in old times the model plantation of florida employing seven hundred negroes raising sugar rice sea island cotton there was upon it a whole village of well-built comfortable negro houses as well built and comfortable as those of any of the white small farmers around there was a planter's house a schoolhouse with chambers for the accommodation of a teacher who was to instruct the planter's children there were barns and a cotton gin and storehouse a sugar house a milk and dairy house an oven and a kitchen each separate buildings 
there were some two or three hundred acres of cleared land fit for the raising of cotton this whole estate had been hired by these young men on the principle of sharing half the profits with the owner after they had carried it on a year some near relatives became partners and then we were frequent visitors there about thirty laboring families were employed upon the place these were from different more northern states who had drifted downward after the emancipation act to try the new luxury of being free to choose their own situation and seek their own fortune some were from georgia some from south and some from north carolina and some from new orleans in fact the debris of slavery washed together in the tide of emancipation such as they were they were a fair specimen of the southern negro as slavery had made and left him the system pursued with them was not either patronizing or sentimental the object was to put them at once on the ground of free white men and women and to make their labor profitable to their employers they were taught the nature of a contract and their agreements with their employers were all drawn up in writing and explained to them the terms were a certain monthly sum of money rations for the month rent of cottage and privileges of milk from the dairy one of the most efficient and intelligent was appointed to be foreman of the plantation and he performed the work of old performed by a driver he divided the hands into gangs appointed their places in the field settled any difficulties between them and in fact was an overseer of the detail like all uneducated people the negroes are great conservatives they clung to the old ways of working to the gang the driver and the old field arrangements even where one would have thought another course easier and wiser in the dim gray of the morning mose blew his horn and all turned out and worked there two or three hours without breakfast and then came back to their cabins to have corn cake made and pork fried and breakfast prepared we suggested that the new england manner of an early breakfast would be more to the purpose but were met by the difficulty nay almost impossibility of making the negroes work in any but the routine to which they had been accustomed but in this routine they worked honestly cheerfully and with a will they had the fruits of their labors constantly in hand and in the form of either rations or wages and there appeared to be much sober content therewith on inquiry it was found that though living in all respectability in families the parties were many of them not legally married and an attempt was made to induce them to enter into holy orders but the men seemed to regard this as the imposing of a yoke beyond what they could bear mose said he had one wife in virginia and one in carolina and how did he know which of them he should like best mandy on the female side objected that she could not be married yet for want of a white lace veil which she seemed to consider essential to the ceremony the survey of mandy in her stuff gown and cowhide boots with her man's hat on following the mule with the plough brought rather ludicrous emotions in connection with this want of a white veil nevertheless the legal marriages were few among them they lived faithfully in their respective family relations and they did their work on the whole effectively and cheerfully their only amusement after working all day seemed to be getting together and holding singing and prayer meetings which they often did to a late hour of the night we used to sit and hear them after ten or eleven o'clock singing and praying and exhorting with the greatest apparent fervor there were one or two of what we called preachers among them men with a natural talent for stringing words together and with fine voices as a matter of curiosity we once sat outside when one of these meetings was going on to hear what it was like the exhortation seemed to consist of a string of solemn-sounding words and phrases images borrowed from scripture scraps of hymns and now and then a morsel that seemed like a roman catholic tradition about the virgin mary and jesus the most prominent image however was that of the angel and the blowing of the last trumpet at intervals amid the flying cloud of images and words came round something about gabriel and the last trump somewhat as follows quote, and he will say gabriel gabriel blow your trump take it cool and easy cool and easy gabriel days all bound for to come End quote. this idea of taking even the blowing of the last trump cool and easy 
seemed to be so like the general negro style of attending to things that it struck me as quite refreshing as to singing the most doleful words with the most lugubrious melodies seemed to be in favour hark from the tombs a doleful sound was a special favourite with eyes shut and mouth open they would pour out a perfect storm of minor keyed melody on poor old dr watts's hymn mispronouncing every word till the old doctor himself could not have told whether they were singing english or timbuktu yet all this was done with a fervour and earnest solemnity that seemed to show that they found something in it whether we could or not who shall say a good old mammy we used to know found great refreshment in a hymn the chorus of which was bust de bonds of dust and thunder bring salvation from on high undoubtedly the words suggested to her very different ideas from what they did to us for she obstinately refused to have them exchanged for good english but when the enlightened wise liberal and refined for generations have found edification and spiritual profit from a service chanted in an unknown tongue who shall say that the poor negroes of our plantation did not derive real spiritual benefit from their night services it was at least an aspiration a reaching and longing for something above animal and physical good a recognition of god and immortality and a future beyond this earth vague and indefinite though it were as to the women they were all of the class born and bred as field hands they were many of them as strong as men could plough and chop and cleave with the best and were held to be among the best field labourers but in all household affairs they were as rough and unskilled as might be expected to mix meal water and salt into a hoe-cake and to fry salt pork or ham or chicken was the extent of their knowledge of cooking and as to sewing it is a fortunate thing that the mild climate requires very slight covering all of them practised rudely cutting fitting and making of garments to cover their children but we could see how hard was their task after working all day in the field to come home and get the meals and then after that have the family sewing to do in our view woman never was made to do the work which supports the family and if she do it the family suffers more for want of the mother's vitality expended in work than it gains in the wages she receives some of the brightest and most intelligent negro men begin to see this and to remove their wives from field labor but on the plantation as we saw it the absence of the mother all day from home was the destruction of any home life or improvement yet with all this the poor things many of them showed a most affecting eagerness to be taught to read and write we carried down and distributed a stock of spelling books among them which they eagerly accepted and treasured with a sort of superstitious veneration and sundays and evenings after work certain of them would appear with them in hand and earnestly beg to be taught alas we never felt so truly what the loss and wrong is of being deprived of early education as when we saw how hard how almost hopeless is the task of acquisition in mature life when we saw the sweat start upon these black faces as our pupils puzzled and blundered over the strange cabalistic forms of the letters we felt a discouraged pity what a dreadful piece of work the reading of the english language is which of us would not be discouraged beginning the alphabet at forty after we left the same scholars were wont to surround one of the remaining ladies sometimes the evening would be so hot and oppressive she would beg to be excused oh missy but two of us will fan you all the time and missy could not but yield to the plea one of the most dreaded characters on the place was the dairy woman and cook minna she had been a field hand in north carolina and worked at cutting down trees grubbing land and mauling rails she was a tall lank powerfully built woman with a pair of arms like windmill sails and a tongue that never hesitated to speak her mind to high or low democracy never assumes a more rampant form than in some of these old negresses who would say their screed to the king on his throne if they died for it the next minute accordingly minna's back was all marked and scored with the tyrant's answers to free speech her old master was accustomed to reply to her unpleasant observations by stretching her over a log staking down her hands and feet and flaying her alive as a most convincing style of argument for all that 
minna was neither broken nor humbled she still asserted her rights as a human being to talk to any other human being as seemed to her good and proper and many an amusing specimen of this she gave us minna had learned to do up gentlemen's shirts passably to iron and to cook after a certain fashion to make butter and to do some other household tasks and so before the wives of the gentlemen arrived on the place she had been selected as a sort of general housekeeper and manager indoors and as we arrived on the ground first we found minna in full command the only female presence in the house it was at the close of a day in may corresponding to our august that mrs f and baby and myself with sundry bales of furniture and household stuff arrived at the place we were dropped down in a lazy little sailboat which had lain half a day becalmed with the blue hazy shores on either side melting into indefinite distance and cast anchor far out in the stream and we had to be rowed in a smaller boat to the long wharf that stretched far out into the waters thence in the thickening twilight we ascended passed through the belt of forest trees that overhung the shore and crossed the wide fields of fine white sand devoted to the raising of cotton the planter's house was a one-story cottage far in the distance rising up under the shelter of a lofty tuft of spanish oaks never shall we forget the impression of weird and almost ludicrous dreariness which took possession of us as mrs f and myself sat down in the wide veranda of the one-story cottage to wait for the gentlemen who had gone down to assist in landing our trunks and furniture the black laborers were coming up from the field and as one and another passed by they seemed blacker stranger and more dismal than anything we had ever seen the women wore men's hats and boots and had the gait and stride of men but now and then an old hooped petticoat or some cast-off thin bedraggled garment that had once been fine told the tale of sex and had a woefully funny effect as we sat waiting minna loomed up upon us in the twilight veranda like a gaunt libyan sibyl walking round and round surveying us with apparent curiosity and responding to all our inquiries as to who and what she was by a peculiarly uncanny chuckle it appeared to amuse her extremely that mr f had gone off and left the pantry locked up so that she could not get us any supper we being faint and almost famished with our day's sail the sight of a white baby dress in delicate white robes with lace and embroidery also appeared greatly to excite her and she stalked round and round with a curious simmer of giggle appearing and disappearing at uncertain intervals like a black sprite during the mortal hour and a half that it cost our friends to land the goods from the vessel after a while some supper was got for us in a wide desolate apartment fitted up with a small cooking stove in the corner never shall we forget the experience of endeavouring to improvise a corn cake the next morning for breakfast we went into the room and found the table standing just as we had left it the night before not a dish washed not a thing done in the way of clearing on inquiry from minna she was gone out to milking it appeared that there were sixteen cows to be milked before her return a little coloured girl stood ready to wait on us with ample good nature lizzie said we have you corn meal oh yes m and she brought it just as the corn had been ground with the bran unsifted a sieve lizzie it was brought a clean pan lizzie quick all right said lizzie let me get a pail of water the water was to be drawn from a deep well in the yard that done lizzie took a pan went out the door produced a small bit of rag and rinsed the pan dashing the contents upon the sand lizzie haven't you any dishcloth no m no towels no m do you always wash dishes this way yes m well then wash this spoon and these two bake pans lizzie good-natured and zealous as the day is long bent over her pail and slopped and scrubbed with her bit of rag now for a pan of sour milk said we it was brought with saleratus and other condiments and the cake was made but on examination the flues of the little cooking-stove were so choked with the resinous soot of the light wood which had been used in it that it would scarcely draw at all and the baking did not progress as in our nice stewart stove in our northern home still the whole experience was so weirdly original that considering this was only a picnic excursion we rather enjoyed it 
when we came to unpack china and crockery and carpets bureau and bedsteads and dressing-glass minna's excitement knew no bounds evidently she considered these articles cast-off remnants of our northern home as the height of splendor when our upper chamber was matted and furnished with white curtains and shades and bed chairs and dressing-glass minna came in to look and her delight was boundless dear me oh lord oh lord she exclaimed turning round and round these yer northern ladies they has everything and they does everything more especially she was taken with the pictures we hung on the walls before one of these raphael's madonna of the veil minna knelt down in a kind of ecstatic trance and thus delivered herself oh good lord if there ain't a good man when he was a baby how harmless he lies there so innocent and here we be we wicked sinners turning our backs on him and going to the old boy oh lord oh lord we ought to be better than we be we certainly ought this invocation came forth with streaming tears in the most natural way in the world and minna seemed for the time being perfectly subdued it was only one of many instances which we have seen of the overpowering influence of works of art on the impressible nervous system of the negro but it is one thing to have an amusing and picturesque specimen of a human being as minna certainly was and another to make one useful in the traces of domestic life as the first white ladies upon the ground mrs f and myself had the task of organizing this barbaric household and of bringing it into the forms of civilized life we commenced with the washing before the time of our coming it had been customary for the gentlemen to give their washing into the hands of minna or judy to be done at such times and in such form and manner as best suited them the manner which did suit them best was to put all the articles to soak indefinitely in soap suds till such time as to them seemed good on being pressed for some particular article and roundly scolded by any of the proprietors they would get up a shirt a pair of drawers a collar or two with abundant promises for the rest when they had time the helpless male individuals of the establishments had no refuge from the feminine ruses and expedients and the fifty incontrovertible reasons which were always on hand to prove to them that things could be done no other way than just as they were done and in fact found it easier to get their washing back again by blandishments than by bullying we ladies announced a regular washing day and endeavored to explain it to our kitchen cabinet our staff consisting of minna and judy detailed for house service judy was a fat lazy crafty roly-poly negress the florida wife of the foreman mose and devoted to his will and pleasures in hopes to supplant the virginie and carolini wives judy said yes to everything we proposed but minna was kinky and argumentative but finally when we represented to her that the proposed arrangement was customary in good northern society she gave her assent we first proceeded to make a barrel of soda washing soap in the great iron sugar kettle which stood out under the fig trees and which had formerly been used for evaporating sugar minna took the greatest interest in the operation and when the soap was finished took the boiling liquid in pailfuls setting them on the top of her head and marching off to the barrel in the house with them without ever lifting a finger we screamed after her in horror minna minna if that should fall it would kill you a laugh of barbaric exultation was the only response as she actually persisted in carrying pailful after pailful of scalding soap on her head till all was disposed of the next day the washing was all brought out under the trees and sorted mrs f and myself presiding and soon minna and judy were briskly engaged at their respective tubs for half an hour all went merry as a marriage bell judy was about half through her first tubful when mose came back from his morning turn in the fields and summoned her to come home and get his breakfast with judy's very leisurely and promiscuous habits of doing business this took her away for half the forenoon meanwhile minna murmured excessively at being left alone and more especially at the continuous nature of the task such a heap of clothes to be washed all in one day it was a mountain of labor in minna's imagination and it took all our eloquence and our constant presence to keep her in good humor we kept at minna as the only means of keeping her at her work 
but after all it was no bad picnic to spend a day in the open air in the golden springtime of florida the birds were singing from every covert the air was perfectly intoxicating in its dreamy softness and so we spread a camp for the baby who was surrounded by a retinue of little giggling adoring negroes and gave ourselves up to the amusement of the scene our encampment was under the broad leaves of a group of fig trees and we hung our clothes to dry on the sharp thorns of a gigantic clump of yucca gloriosa which made an admirable clothes frame by night with chuckling admiration minna surveyed a great basket full of clean clothes all done in one day the next day came the lesson on ironing and the only means of securing minna and judy to constant work at the ironing table was the exercise of our own individual powers of entertainment and conversation we had our own table and ironed with them and all went well till judy remembered she had preparations for moses dinner and deserted minna kept up some time longer till finally when we went in the next room on an errand she improved the opportunity to desert on returning we saw minna's place vacant a half-finished shirt lying drying on the table searching and calling we at last discovered her far in the distance smoking her pipe and lolling tranquilly over the fence of a small enclosure where were sixteen calves shut up together so that maternal longings might bring the cow mothers home to them at night why minna what are you doing we said as we came up breathless laws missus i wanted to feed my calves i just happened to think on it and forthwith she turned starting to the barn and came back with a perfect haymow on her head then crossing the fence into the enclosure she proceeded to make division of the same among the calves who tumultuously surrounded her she patted one and cuffed another and laboured in the most maternal style to make them share their commons equally laughing in full content of heart and appearing to have forgotten her ironing table and all about it it was in vain to talk she was tired of ironing did anybody ever hear of doing up all one's things in a day besides she wanted to see her calves she just felt like it and minna planted her elbows on the fence and gazed and smoked and laughed and talked baby talk to her calves till we were quite provoked yet we could not help laughing in fact long before that day was done we were out of breath used up and exhausted with the strain of getting the work out of minna it was more tantalizing as she could do with a fair amount of skill anything she pleased and could easily have done the whole in a day had she chosen it is true she was droll enough in a literary and artistic sense to make one's fortune in a magazine or story but when one had a house to manage a practical humorist is less in point than in some other places the fact was minna like all other women bred to the fields abominated housework like a man she could do here and there and by fits and starts and snatches but to go on in anything like a regular domestic routine was simply disgusting in her eyes so after a short period of struggle it was agreed that minna was to go back to field work where she was one of the most valuable hands and a trained house servant was hired from jacksonville minna returned to the field with enthusiasm we heard her swinging her long arms and shouting to her gang come on den boys and gals i'm for the fields i was born i was raised i was fairly begot in the fields and i don't want none of your housework in time we obtained a cook from jacksonville trained accomplished neat who made beautiful bread biscuits and rolls and was a comfort to our souls but this phoenix was soon called for by the wants of the time and was worth more than we could give and went from us to enjoy forty dollars a month as cook in a hotel such has been the good fortune of all the well-trained house servants since emancipation they command their own price the untrained plantation hands and their children are and will be just what education may make them the education which comes to them from the state from being freemen and voters able to make contracts choose locations and pursue their own course like other men is a great deal and it is operating constantly and efficaciously we give the judgment of a practical farmer accustomed to hire laborers at the north and the south and as a result of five years experiment on this subject he says that the negro laborer carefully looked after is as good as any that can be hired at the north in some respects they are better as a class they are more obedient better-natured more joyous and easily satisfied 
the question as to whether on the whole the negroes are valuable members of society and increasing the material wealth of the state is best answered by the returns of the freedmen's savings and trust company an institution under the patronage of government the report of this institution for the year eighteen seventy two is before us and from this it appears that the negro laborers in the different southern states have deposited with this trust company this year the sum of thirty one million two hundred and sixty thousand four hundred and ninety nine dollars the report also shows that year by year the amount deposited has increased thus in eighteen sixty seven it was only one million six hundred and twenty four thousand eight hundred and eighty three in eighteen sixty eight it was three million odd in eighteen sixty nine it was seven million odd in eighteen seventy twelve million odd in eighteen seventy one nineteen million and odd these results are conclusive to the fact that as a body the southern laborers are a thrifty industrious advancing set and such as they are proved by the large evidence of these figures such we have observed them in our more limited experience our negro laborers with all the inevitable defects of imperfect training ignorance and the negligent habits induced by slavery have still been as a whole satisfactory laborers they keep their contracts do their work and save their earnings we could point to more than one black family about us steadily growing up to competence by industry and saving all that is wanted to supply the south with a set of the most desirable skilled laborers is simply education the negro children are bright they can be taught anything and if the whites who cannot bear tropical suns and fierce extremes neglect to educate a docile race who both can and will bear it for them they throw away their best chance of success in a most foolish manner no community that properly and carefully educates the negro children now growing up need complain of having an idle thriftless dishonest population about them common schools ought to prevent that the teaching in the common schools ought to be largely industrial and do what it can to prepare the children to get a living by doing something well practical sewing cutting and fitting for girls and the general principles of agriculture for boys might be taught with advantage the negroes are largely accused of being thievish and dishonest a priori we should expect that they would be so we should imagine that to labor without wages for generations in a state of childish dependence would so confuse every idea of right and wrong that the negro would be a hopeless thief our own experience however is due in justice to those we have known on the first plantation as we have said were about thirty families from all different southern states it might be supposed that they were a fair sample now as to facts it was the habit of the family to go to bed nights and leave the house doors unlocked and often standing wide open the keys that locked the provisions hung up in a very accessible place and yet no robbery was ever committed we used to set the breakfast table overnight and leave it with all the silver upon it yet lost nothing in our own apartment we put our rings and pins on our toilet cushions as had been our habit we had bits of bright calico and ribbons and other attractive articles lying about and the girl that did the chamber work was usually followed by a tribe of little curious observing negroes and yet we never missed so much as a shred of calico neither was this because they did not want them for the gift of a strip of calico or ribbon would throw them into raptures it was simply that they did not steal again nothing is more common when we visit at the north than to have the complaint made that fruit is stolen out of gardens we have had people tell us that the vexation of having fruit carried off was so great that it took away all the pleasures of a garden now no fruit is more beautiful more tempting than the orange we live in an orange grove surrounded by negroes and yet never have any trouble of this kind we have often seen bags of fine oranges lying all night under the trees and yet never have we met with any perceptible loss certainly it is due to the negroes that we have known to say that they are above average of the many of the lower classes at the north for honesty we have spoken now for the average negro what we have said is by no means the best that can with truth be said of the finer specimens among them we know some whose dignity of character delicacy good principle and generosity are admirable and more to be admired because these fine traits have come up under the most adverse circumstances 
in leaving this subject we have only to repeat our conviction that the prosperity of the more southern states must depend in a large degree on the right treatment and education of the negro population end of chapter twenty the laborers of the south end of palmetto leaves by harriet beecher stowe read for you by librivox volunteers in two thousand seventeen